Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Do me a favor, stand up on your feet one time. We're going to read verses 24 down through verse 30. Matthew 13, 24 through verse 30. Here's what it says. It says, And another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and then he went his way. And when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said to him, Did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Father, we thank you for your word today. The entrance of your word brings light, gives understanding to the simple. Today we ask the Holy Spirit to anoint this word into our hearts, anoint our ears to hear, and help us to see that which you want us to see. Change our lives. Speak to us, O God. May men and women be saved and set free today by the power of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated this morning, and I think all of you look lovely today. Uh, If you missed last week, we had started a series called The Harvest. And as we're talking about the harvest, very specifically and very strategically last week, we talked about how that God wants an end-time harvest of souls. Uh, In Scripture, over and over again, uh, the people of God and the great ingathering that happens towards the end of the age is referred to as the harvest. And so uh, Jesus gave parables about the sower and the seed. We're going to look at that a little bit in a minute. But there are some basic key elements that we talked about last week as we got ready to transition out of the service on what needs to happen before you plant a harvest. Uh, I don't want to ask you to raise your hand this morning for uh, an elementary lesson, so let me just go over those again quickly. The first thing was you had to plow the field, right? Before you plant the seed, you've got to plow the field. That means to forcefully uh, to take the rocks, take the roots, take the sticks, anything that would keep the seed from germinating in that hard, compacted ground. And so you've got to prepare the soil in order to receive the seed. Then the second thing that we covered last week in this harvest time was that you had to actually plant the seed. Everybody say plant the seed. We gave you a very, very simple yet profound uh, truth last week. You cannot have a harvest for a seed you didn't sow. Come on. You've got to plant the seed. So uh, it does no good to have a pocket or a satchel full of seeds and say, man, I sure wish I had a harvest. No, the Lord says we've got to plant the seeds into the ground. Then there's this law that we looked at in the Old Testament. It's called the law of seed time and harvest right and we discussed how us in our impatience don't like the time but we discussed in the fact that while we don't like the time because when we're looking at it it seems like nothing is happening but how many of you know in the kingdom of God there's never inactivity God's always doing something and underneath the soil there is a procedure that is happening with that seed that is breaking forth new life to come forward and so then we've got this time and then all of a sudden there's there's a spot to where the field is ripe unto harvest and so our fourth thing was then you have to harvest or to go out and bring in the harvest and in that we discussed that harvest time while it's a time of rejoicing it is not a time of laziness Because it's work to bring in the harvest. Anybody who harvests corn or wheat or cotton or anything like that will tell you that those are the days you have to get up earlier and you have to go to bed later because you got to bring in the harvest. And so last week we talked about relating this to souls and seeing people saved. We've got to pray. We've got to root up anything in our hearts or lives. We've got to sow the seed of the gospel. And then, you know, Paul said some plant, some water, yet God gives the increase. And ultimately a soul born again into the kingdom of God is the the equivalent of a harvest. This morning, I want to talk to you from a 
different subject about the harvest. This one is um, a, a very difficult subject to teach. An even more difficult subject matter to preach. Because on the surface, people look at this and they, they, they scratch their head. And I surmise that this morning, some of you are going to leave this auditorium, this sanctuary, scratching your head. And if that is the case, I have met my goal. Because the Apostle Paul said, let a man examine himself to see if he be in the faith. This morning, I want to talk to you from the subject, while men slept. While men slept. Several years ago, my wife and I were taking a trip to Israel. Wonderful uh, family blessed us to be able to do that. And we decided, since we were flying out of New York, we'd never been there. Her and I both are uh, country people. Our parents, even though my, my family transplanted from Los Angeles, they did that when I was five, so I have no recollection. And so at, at age five, we moved from L.A. to L.A., from Los Angeles to lower Arkansas. Uh, I never lived in a town over uh, 16,000 my whole growing up through high school. So much like Woodward, Oklahoma, she was born and raised there. And so we said, we want to go see New York City. Because that's what you do. So we, we took an extra day to go and see Times Square. Because up until this point, we'd only seen it on New Year's Eve, watching the ball drop. You see all of the digital signs, all of the billboards, all of these awesome things. And it was, just, it was amazing. And I actually will confess to you, I stayed out till almost 2 o'clock in the morning walking around Times Square because there are so much, so much electricity, so many billboards that light up, it seems daylight all day long. It's interesting. And so one of our friends said, if you're going to go to New York City, you've got to check out Chinatown. And Chinatown is a very interesting little place. And so we, by the grace of God and with the, with the presence of 10,000 angels, we, dropped, we jumped into the back of a uh, very, very eclectic uh, taxi driver who I don't know where he took his driving lessons from, but uh, it's a miracle that we got there. And uh, it was amazing as uh, we're just like, look at the ground, look at the ground, look at the ground. Don't look out the windows. All these pretty things were going by us, people honking their horns. They like to use sign language there for some reason. Everybody's waving signs out the door. I don't know what that's about. But interesting enough, we get to Chinatown and we start on the very beginning and we begin to walk. And you see all types of things. One thing that intrigued me, because I was pastored in Louisiana for five years, and so I love good seafood. I like crabs and the shrimp and all the fresh fish and I saw this big open market, which really was intriguing. And then we began to walk by some other shops, and I began to notice that there were some curtains to some hidden stairwells where people would pop out every once in a while, and they would look around to make sure nobody was looking, and then they would try to motion you to come in. And, and we didn't go back there because I'd already been tipped off on what it was. But what they have back here in some of those places are some of the best counterfeits that you will ever lay your eyes on. Most of us in this room could not afford to go out and buy a thirty dollars or $40,000 Rolex watch. But there are some places in Chinatown where you set your eyes upon a Rolex and even the most knowledgeable person would not be able to tell without actually knowing the detail of how fake these particular items are. They don't just stop at Rolex watches. They have uh, Gucci bags and all these high-end uh, Prada and these high-end fashion designers that all of these clothing and even shoes, Nike shoes and, and, and Air, uh, Air Jordans, all of these expensive items. You go back there and what normally would cost you $500, $1,000, $5,000, you can get it for the low price of $99.99. The only problem is, it's not real. It looks real, but at the end of the day, it simply just doesn't pass the test. That leads me to a thought this morning. Satan's work is that of an imitator. Satan has no creative power. 
The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and God said, let there be light and light was and he created the firmaments above and beneath, the stars, the moon, the sun, the light. He created all of the trees and every creeping thing upon the earth and he created mankind in his image. Every seed bearing herb was to be uh, produced after its own kind and God created with his power the world that you and I see. Love the way the book of Colossians records it. It says, in him through all things were created, and through him all things exist. One translation says, in him all things like glue are held together. God created the world by his word. But his adversary, Satan, has no creative power. All he can do is pervert, duplicate, and counterfeit. It's interesting. You see it throughout Scripture. Not only does Satan produce false, false converts, but if you look at Galatians chapter 1, uh, verses 6 through 9, Paul says that Satan produces a counterfeit gospel. In Romans chapter 10, 1 through 3, Satan produces a counterfeit righteousness. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, he creates a counterfeit church, a harlot church. And then at the end of the age, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12 says he creates a counterfeit Christ, or we know it as the Antichrist. See, this morning leads us to look at the background of our passage. In Matthew chapter 13, at the beginning, Jesus gives us a parable of the seed and the sower. And I love Jesus because he gives us the meaning to this parable. And I'm not going to turn over there and read all of it. And you don't necessarily need to either. It would be great for you to look at this afternoon or this week. But Jesus in Matthew's gospel chapter 13 verse 1. He says, on the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And multitudes, great multitudes were gathered together to him. So that he got in a boat and sat. And while whole multitudes stood on the shore. And he began to speak to them these parables. It went like this, behold, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed, fell by the wayside. Birds came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, stony places where they did not have much earth, and immediately they sprang up, but because they had, no, and because they had no depth of the earth. But when the sun was up, and, and they were scorched, and they began uh, to wither away because they had no root. Some fell among thorns, sprang up, and the thorns choked them, but others fell on good ground. Jesus is giving us a story of the gospel. The God's word is a seed. It's an everlasting seed that is eternal in its value. It produces fruit. In fact, the, the word of God is so potent that the, the book of uh, Numbers says that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Has he not spoken it? Shall he not also bring it to pass? Uh, Isaiah the prophet said, as the snow falls down from heaven, waters the earth and brings forth buds, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that what I've sent it to do. God's word is powerful. And in seed form, implanted into the human heart, it begins to pr produce fruit and, and, and gifts and the righteousness of God and the character of Christ. Paul says it like this, my beloved children, how I've labored with you, I've toiled with you until Christ be formed in you, until they got to the image of the one who created them. The word of God is powerful. Paul also wrote, it's sharp, it's quicker than any two-edged sword. The Bible says that while men slept, the enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat. Now, this is interesting. Stay with me. Very, very, very awakening this morning as we look at this. The enemy sowed tares among the wheat. Now, you may say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, one of the biggest problems with tares among the wheat is that they look identical. Much like the Gucci bag, much like the Prada, much like the counterfeit $100 bill I saw this week at Dairy Queen, they looked identical. Couldn't tell the difference externally. How many of you know we are visual people? 
We're not supposed to judge on external appearance, but we do every day. The Bible says uh, concerning David and his selection by God, man looks on the outward appearance, but only God can look on and discern the heart. You and I see the clothing, we see the hairstyle, we see the, the glasses, we see the shoes, we see the actions that people do day in and day out. But what we can't see, lest the Lord opens our spiritual eyes, is the heart motive of a person. And this wheat and this tear are growing in this field, and it's very difficult to tell them apart because they look the same. Imagine how confusing something like this is. But this morning, I really feel like as we're focusing on the harvest, you and I need to be aware of this simple truth. That not everything that glitters, come on somebody, is gold. Not everything that sparkles is a diamond. And not everything... That looks churchy is from God. You see, everybody wants to talk about fake news, fake news, fake news. How come nobody talks about fake Christians? Because Jesus talked about it. He said there were tares sown in with the wheat. And this morning, I want to challenge your intellectual thinking. I want you to reason with me. The scripture says, come reason with me together now, says the Lord. And, and let's reason with the scripture and see what we can learn. Go back to our text with me. Go back with me to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Let's read these verses again, and then let's, let's just begin to execute them together. Matthew, the 13th chapter, verse 24, and another parable. This is right after the parable of the seed and the sower. And another parable he, he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed. Everybody say good seed. Good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat. And then he just went his way. When the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owners came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. Then the servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, no, let them both grow together into the harvest at the same time because I will say uh, to, the, to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles. And he says, then I will uh, gather them, uh, uh, burn the bundles of the tares, but I'll gather the wheat in my barns. Now, I think I accidentally skipped over a verse, but here's what he's trying to, to say here. When you're looking at this, I want you to look at the, the whole picture, Okay. I had something in my eye, so I apologize about that. Here's the first thing. Ready? Concerning the wheat and tares, number one, they were both planted in the same field. They were both planted in the same field. One field, place of harvest. In this one field, there are wheat, there are tares. We've already established the fact that both of these tares and wheat look identical, but there's a great difference that we've got to see that is revealed in two very important ways. Are you ready? First of all, we've got to look at the character of the seed. The wheat produced wheat because that's what wheat, wheat seeds do. Those grains, they produce after their own kind. This is a spiritual principle found in Genesis chapter number 1 and 2. Every seed-bearing herb, plant of the field, and animal produce after their own kind, right? Cows don't make dogs. Come on. Apple trees don't make bananas. Banana trees don't produce almonds. Come on. And wheat don't produce tares. Wheat produce wheat. The purity of that seed that we've got to understand, the Scripture tells us that seed is the Word of God. When the Word of God is implanted in a human heart, something happens. It's transformational. The seed can no longer remain the same. Can I tell you why? Because the Scripture says, unless the seed go into the ground and die, it abides alone. There's a process beneath the soil whereby that seed experiences death and then consequentially new life. 
People who are saved, people who come to Christ, people who receive the word of the gospel, they receive life transformation. The old man is crucified. The new man is resurrected. We walk in the newness of life that Jesus Christ has provided. Can somebody say amen for that? I don't know about you. I remember the day I gave my life to Christ. I remember the day that, that I realized that I needed a Savior. I'd grown up in church my whole life. I've said it a thousand times. Great grandpa was a pastor. My grandma was a secretary. My grandpa was a deacon. I, I glued stuff onto cardboard plates, amen, and had flannel boards and flannel graphs. I grew up in church. But just because I grew up in church doesn't mean I was saved. Doesn't mean I was saved. Listen, when I got saved, let me just, let me just tell you something. When I got saved, I already knew all the Bible stories. I've been listening to them for 13 years. I already knew about Jonah and the well and, and, and Moses in the Red Sea and, and all of those things. But see, sometimes people think that because they have a knowledge of God, that somehow that equates to salvation. But friends, listen, I'm telling you that the true seed of the Word of God produces a spiritual transformation. There's a born-again experience. The character of the seed produces that. But yet, there's another seed that the enemy came in and he sowed it while men were unconscious. He sowed in the tares. This seed produces other tares because it, because it cannot produce the real thing. See, you need to write this down in the margin of your Bible. The counterfeit can never produce the real thing. The counterfeit can never produce the real thing. It can only produce more like it. While the seed of the gospel is the word of God, the seed that produces growth in the counterfeit is false. There are people who trust in God for salvation through Christ, which is what somebody does who encounters the real gospel message. Then there are people who trust in their works, they trust in their relationships, they trust in the proximity to people and, and what family they were born into and, and all of these various things. Consequently, they can grow up thinking that they're saved and they're not. We look at the character of the seed. Now, secondly, look at the character of the soil character of the sower sorry the one who sowed the good seed his intention was to produce a bountiful harvest his intention was that when harvest time comes there are things that can be reaped and received the fruit of the harvest the bounty of the harvest that was his idea was to be able to to receive the reward of his labor but while he was sleeping his enemy came and he sowed tares among the wheat and we got to ask ourselves, why did the enemy do that? Why did he sow tares among the wheat? Well, the answer is simple. He did so because if he sowed enough tares in with the wheat, it would ultimately ruin the crop, and it was an attack on the farmer himself. Because it's a pretty sad deal when harvest time comes, and you look like you've got this big field full of wheat, only to go to harvest and realize that a half or two-thirds of what you thought was good is actually bad. Useless. Bind it up, bundle it up, burn it. It's not good. They both were planted in the same field. Can I tell you something this morning? Satan is in the business of sowing tares among the Lord's wheat. Why? Because he knows that if he can place enough of the artificial among the genuine, then he can devastate the entire crop. Satan's business is to undo everything that the Lord has done. My thinking has changed on this throughout the years. Because I used to see people acting a fool in church and causing problems and trouble and and, and people say, well, you know, maybe they're just a baby Christian. They don't know. Maybe they're a tear. 
Maybe they're a tear. Because listen to me. The real seed produces the real fruit. And it is possible to look one way on the outside and to look totally different on the inside. I think Jesus addressed this when he dealt with the Pharisees. He said, you whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. He said, outside you're clean, but on the inside you're like a cemetery. Ooh, it's good preaching this morning. The enemy wants to undo all that the Lord is doing, so he produces tares among the wheat, tares among the crop. He begins to infest all of these things because he knows that if he can fill the harvest full of tares, and if he knows that he can fill the church full of religious but unsaved people, then he can fill hell with the multitude of deceived people. Think about it. Here's the second thing I want us to look at this morning. The wheat and tares, not only were they both planted in the same field, number two, they both grew together. They both grew together. Our text tells us that the enemy came and they both grew up together. And it was at the revealing of harvest time when they finally realized what all had happened. Now, this is interesting because not only did the good grow, but the bad also grew. People used to say, oh man, that church right there, man, they must be so healthy because they're growing. Cancer also grows. Amen. Growth, if it's not healthy, doesn't mean anything. If you got a church full of a bunch of uh, backslidden, unsaved, non-born again people, and they think they're saved, you got a church full of tares. Both of them grew together. They gave the external example of being what they were trying to purvey, wheat, but at the end of the day, they were not. I want to look at the activity of the wheat. It's interesting, both the wheat and the tares, they grew together, and as the wheat grew, the tares grew beside them. They did everything that the wheat did, and they looked good doing it. They did everything that the wheat did, and they looked good doing it. Came to the potluck, came to the revival service, came to the small group, came to whatever, and they looked good, but they weren't wheat. They were tares. Now listen, hey, don't get mad at me. I didn't write this. It's in the Bible, right? There's churches all across town you can get cotton candy, but not here. We have the meat of the word here. I'd rather you go to heaven and be upset with me than go to hell and be happy with me. Come on. There's a difference between the wheat and the tares. They were looking identical together, but yet they weren't. They both grew together. Everybody say together. Look at this. We know wheat grows. People who are saved they give their life to Christ. They're a baby Christian. They don't know if, the, if it's the book of Job or the book of Job. Come on. They don't know if Genesis is the last book of the Bible or the first book of the Bible. But they're in seedling form. But guess what? The more they stay in Christ, the more they stay planted, the more they stay hooked up to the life source, they begin to grow. They begin to produce fruit in their lives. Uh, actions change. Attitude changes. Different things begin to change in their life. They, they learn how to pray. They learn how to worship. They learn about faithfulness to God. They learn about loving thy neighbor. They, they learn about all of these things. And, and we all know Christians grow. Anybody in this room glad that you're not where you need to be, but you're not where you used to be? Amen. I still have some growing to do because harvest has not come yet. Jesus has not yet come to reap me yet. So I still got some growing to do. But consequently, the wheat also grows. And so here you have this person that they can quote all of the books of the Bible. They can preach the Bible if they wanted to. They know how to put a sermon together. They might even know the proper way how to pray. But they're not saved. You say, Pastor, how in the world can that be? 
Oh, it's possible. It is extremely possible. One of the most shocking verses in the Bible is found in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus said, not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Except he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then say, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. He said, depart from me. I never knew you. What's he trying to say? Tear. Look like the wheat. You say, well, I thought they prophesied. I thought they cast out devils. Because even the word of God in Balaam's donkey's mouth is effective. Let us not think that the word of God is only effective because of the vessel it flows through. Listen, God uses imperfect vessels. That's why you can see uh, these, these creepy, slick-haired evangelists on TV who are nothing but creepy in real life. And you might say, but somebody was healed in their meeting or somebody was saved in their meeting. That's because God uses people in spite of themselves. His word is pure when the vessel might not be pure. But I want you to get this. It's possible for somebody to have all of the zeal, all of the knowledge, all of the education, and know the mysteries of God and still not know God. I know this is blowing your mind today, but it's true. They grew together. If they were side by side, you would not have been able to tell them apart that's the way it is in church isn't it we can't tell oftentimes between the genuine and the artificial the tares in the church they dress right they talk right they walk right they give every appearance of being saved and if you had examined a real christian and a tear together you really couldn't externally tell them apart problem is though they had the appearance of wheat They didn't have the abundance of wheat because they couldn't produce. See, Christians produce fruit, tares, cannot. Now, interesting, these tares, when they get to full maturity, they stand tall. Stand at attention. The real wheat, though, one way you can tell the difference between the wheat and the tares, there is an external way and there is an an internal way, but you can't really do it until harvest time. The wheat that is real, it kind of bends lowly because inside, if you were to open it up in the heart of it, there are heavy kernels of grain, and at maturity, it causes them to bow low. But not the tares. The tares continue to stand upright. You know why? Because when you open up the heart of a tear, what you find is little black weightless seeds. Little black weightless seeds that have no ability to produce anything of lasting goodness. So that is with the tares in the church. They give all the external appearances of being the real deal. They look right, they act right, they talk right, they walk right. But when you get down to it, there's no fruit in their life. Now, you would think that when you notice this, your job would be to fix it. Let's fix it. Let's just rip and roll and let's just take it. Let's cut it all down. Put the axe to the root, buddy. Let's just pull all this mess out of here. We got to clean up the Lord's church. But the scripture says you don't need to do that. Because if you have a, 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 a wheat stalk here and you have a tear stalk right here, it's very possible that their roots may have gotten interconnected. And therefore, when you pick up the bad one, you might have two or three casualties of a good one. So he said, don't do that. Just let them grow. Let them grow. Let them do their thing. Let them do their thing. Just let them grow up. You say, man, that's terrible. I don't think we should do that. Well, Jesus has his reasons. Let them grow. Let them grow up. Let them get, let them get to the place of the harvest. Here, here's why it's important. You ready? Not only did they both grow together, but number three, they were both harvested together. 
Eventually, the day harvest arrived, he said, okay, let's go out and gather in the harvest. Wheat, this side. Tear, this side. Wheat, this side. Tears, this side. And so he would go back and forth, back and forth, getting the wheat, putting it on this side. And on the tares, he would put on this side because they were both harvested together. Here's what I need you to know. There is a harvest day coming. Coming. There's a harvest day coming. See, one of the interesting things about harvest time, I've referenced it a minute ago, Wheat, when it's harvest time, they bend down low in humility. The tares stand up right in pride. Look at me. Look what I've done. Look what I've, all these things. The truth of the matter is, is that one had fruit, one did not have fruit. So the harvesters would go and he would take the sickle and reap it in and they would put the tares on this, on the wheat on this side, the tares on this side, until the harvest was reaped. And then notice Notice this. We find this in the last couple of verses. Verse number 30 of our text. He said, let, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, and gather the wheat into my barn. Now, we got to ask ourselves the question this morning, what is the moral of the story? What we're finding here in this passage concerning the harvest is Jesus has given us a picture of eternity. I know it's not super popular. I know television doesn't like to talk about it. Hallmark movies don't like to allude to it. But the truth is, is that there is a heaven and there is a hell. Contrary than you believe, and I can prove it with Scripture, and all you got to prove it with is a Hallmark card. More people go to hell than heaven. Jesus said it himself. Broad is the way, and many go into destruction. But narrow is the way that leads to everlasting life, and few there be that find it. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. The people were eating, drinking, giving in marriage until the day that the ark door closed. There were eight people, Noah, Ham, Sham, Japheth, and all of their wives. And God shut the door of the ark, and the rest of the world was swept away in a flood. There will be more people that end up lost than end up saved. That's not God's will. He wills that none perish. But they will because of their choice, they will because of the lack of, har- of laborers in the harvest field. We covered last week, a harvest can be wasted if it's not reaped in time. But I want you to notice, they were both harvested together. The tares were gathered together, and they were bundled, and they were cast into the fire. Everybody say the fire. Here's another stark reality for every one of us in this room. Jesus referenced hell three times more than he ever referenced heaven. Eternal judgment. That people who reject God, people who trust in things and their self rather than in Christ, self-assurance, self-works, those who reject the Lord, they go to a place of everlasting fire. Revelation described it like this. He said, it's where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched and the smoke of their torment ascends day and night forever and ever and they have no rest. You see, it's not the physical fire that is, uh, not the physical body that's burning in hell because if that was the case, then our body would just burn up and you would cease to be, but it's the spiritual body and it never is consumed. Hell is eternal. It's a real place. It's not metaphorical. It's not fictional. It is a real place. There are people there right now waiting for the white throne judgment. And on harvest day, these tares will get bound up and they're going to be thrown into the fire. 
And I can just imagine all of the little tares screaming on the way to the fire. But I'm a wheat. Look at me. Look at what I've done. I went to church my whole life. But the Bible doesn't say, go to church your whole life and you'll be saved. The Bible says, trust in the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. But I gave $25,000 to the missionary. The Bible doesn't say, give big offerings and be saved. The Bible says, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and don't trust in your riches. What the rich young ruler was told, because he trusted in his money. Don't get me twisted. God doesn't mind if you have stuff. He just minds if stuff has you. The tares looked like a harvest, but yet they weren't. The tares were gathered and burned, but the wheat, but the wheat was gathered and barned. It was placed storage bin. It was placed in the master's. Love what Jesus said, right? John chapter 4. I'm sorry, John chapter 14. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it weren't I so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I go, there you be also. And he said, I will come again and receive you to myself. And, and Thomas spoke up and said, Lord, where are you going? And how will we even know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. The truth and the life. And nobody, everybody say nobody, comes to the Father except through me. Let me give you a nugget of revelation real quick. Darren, you can come. I'm getting ready to close. I don't know if you've ever heard this scripture quite like this, but I want to I give it to you today. I'm getting ready to close. This is not in my notes. John chapter 10. Turn your Bible over there. Turn your Bible over there, John chapter 10. Jesus is telling us about the fact that he's the good shepherd. He's the true shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep, right? Is that what he says? I want you to look at verse 7. Not on the screen, not in your notes. John 10 verse 7. You can start playing softly if you can. Notice this, it says, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. And if anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. And he will go in and he will find pasture. And look at verse 10. We misquote this one just like we do Jeremiah 29, 11. Look at it. The thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Stop right there. Yes, I know the devil's a thief. Yes, I know he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But the devil is not the thief in the context of John 10. Jesus tells us in the culminating verses, just a few verses before there. We looked at it just a moment ago. Verse number 8, all who ever came before me were thieves and robbers. You know what they would do? In biblical days, the sheepfold, like a manger where Jesus would have been born, was not a little bitty wood shack like we make it out to be, but it would have been hewed out into the side of a mountain or a cliff. And there would have been a, 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 a place there, like a big round entrance. And the shepherd at night, he would curl up and he would lay in the door of the sheep. So the, the shepherd was separating the outside world from the sheep. And the shepherd was a light sleeper. So if anybody would try to, to come in through the door, they'd have to go through him. And then he could protect the sheep. But Jesus said, the thief doesn't come through the door. He tries to climb up another way. You know, religion says that you can get to God by good works, by coming to church three, four times a week, by giving a lot of money. Listen, 
Jesus was referring to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was referring to the religious that came before him who said, we keep the law, we're right with God. But they didn't know him or the Holy Spirit. So get this. They didn't know that Jesus was the only way. And here's what Jesus said. The thief, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know why? People are religious. They come to church, they're religious. They're miserable. They're some of the most meanest people you ever see. They come out of obligation. They don't have joy. They don't like to worship. Nothing. It's just a check mark off their list. Well, God, I gave you my tithe. Well, God, we got to listen to this song again. Well, God, we got to do this. Well, God, we got to do that. As if that creates a good standing with you and God. It doesn't. Jesus said, the only way to have a relationship with me is to enter in by the door. It's to have a relationship with Christ, an intimate transformational relationship where he is the Lord of your life. He is the ransom for your sin. He's the payment for your penalty. He is everything that you need. You are his servant. He is your master and Lord. The tares looked like wheat. They were a counterfeit. But the wheat, it was taken, and it was placed in a barn. Here's what Jesus said. Everybody close your Bible. Stand up with me. Here's what Jesus said. So good. Listen to this. I quoted it just a moment ago. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms, if it were not told you. And I go and prepare a place for you, that where I go, you may be also. And when I come again, I will receive you to myself. The scripture says in Matthew 24 that at the end of the age, the reapers, the angels, will go out and reap the harvest and the wicked will be thrown into everlasting fire. But the saints of God were going to the Father's house. We're going to the Father's house. If I could say anything to you this morning, it's this. I told you if I had you scratching your head, I did my job. But listen to me this morning. I want you to hear me. Hear my heart today. I have preached my guts out this morning like an evangelist. Now hear my heart as a pastor. I didn't preach this message for you to walk out of here and doubt your salvation. Listen, the Bible says if you're born again, your spirit bears witness with God's spirit that you're a child of God. What I am asking you to consider though is your salvation experience. You know, it's troubled me. I've asked some people before, tell me about when you, get, when you got saved. And they couldn't do it. I don't mean a date, a time, what second it was on your watch, but I mean just the experience. Well, I just remember growing, it, growing up in church my whole life. That won't get it, folks. You've got to have a, an encounter with Christ. Do we trust in the cross and what happened on the cross and Jesus' sacrifice for our salvation? Or are we trusting in what we have done? What we can do? What we can add to the world? The truth is, the plain truth is that you can look saved and not be saved. You can look saved and not be saved. This is a hard altar call. Because listen, According to the scripture, there are members of churches who are not saved. You say, well, how'd they become members, pastor? Well, because they looked looked right on the outside. They checked the boxes. I mean, we're not the judge externally, you know. They're not saved. How do we know? Scripture gives us the litmus test. They not receive the right seed. So really, honestly... I wrestled with this this week because I always look at a message and I look at the end before I look at the beginning. Much like a builder builds a house, he sees the end and starts the opposite direction. And I said, Lord, how in the world can I give an altar call for this this morning? And here's what I'll say. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. 
I want to ask you this morning. Do you really know Jesus? I mean, do you really know him? Have you had an encounter with Jesus where the weight of your sin was felt upon your shoulders? The Holy Spirit drew you to a place of salvation. And you confessed Christ as your Savior and Jesus as your Lord. And he took your sin and he gave you his righteousness. Do you remember this experience that you had? If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Brad, I've never had that experience. I've never truly given my heart to Christ. I, I, this is pride. It, it deals with the pride of my heart because I've been going to church a long time. I've read the Bible stories. I know them. I can quote the songs. I know all the hymns. I, I, I know all of those things. Yes, but are you saved? Because we may not be able to tell right now, but here's the crux of the matter. Harvest time's coming. Harvest time's coming. And in the natural, listen to me now, in the natural, a tear can never become a wheat. But in the supernatural, a lost can become found. possible. Every head bowed, every eye closed.